From Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 67, recorded on the 26th of May, 2025. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Vincent, and happy Memorial Day. Indeed, today is Memorial Day, and to show you how dedicated we are, we're recording. I have another podcast right after this one as well. I love doing this. Uh, this is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, Cutting to the Chase on important health topics. And today we're going to discuss his latest column called Silencing the CDC. Who knew that you could ever even consider doing that? But we're going to talk about that today. So let's start by uh, having you tell us about respiratory syncytial virus in infections and, and options to prevent disease. Right. So Respiratory syncytial virus, RSV, is the most common reason for young infants to come to the hospital. Um, in the United States, it causes between 60,000 and 80,000 hospitalizations a year and 100 to 300 deaths. In the world, it causes 3.4 million hospitalizations a year and about 100,000 deaths. Now, the way that that virus affects babies is it, it causes inflammation in the small breathing tube, so-called bronchioles. Um, which then causes bronchiolitis, which can be fatal. So it's a, it's a very common reason to come into the hospital. Because it primarily affects children less than two months of age, it's very hard to have an active immunization program in that group. So really what they benefit from is passive antibodies, antibodies acquired either transplacentally after maternal immunization or antibodies acquired by giving the child directly a long-acting monoclonal antibody like nirsevimab. So... Recently, the CDC published a study uh, looking at the impact of these um, interventions on RSV. And so what did they find? This was a seminal study. What they did was they looked at, at the past year, 2024 to 2025, when both of these modalities was, were available, both maternal vaccination and the RSV-specific monoclonal antibody, nirsevimab. Then they compared that to, to 2020, 2018 to 2020, sort of pre-pandemic before either of these uh, strategies were available to see, did they work? Do we have, have we had an impact? Has it caused a decrease in hospitalization? And the answer was yes, it did cause a decrease in hospitalization overall in children less than five, about a 40% decrease. But if, for children specifically less than two months of age, it was more than a 50% decrease, which you can, when you consider the number of hospitalizations and the number of deaths in this country, that is a dramatic finding. And in fact, associated with that, there was somewhat of a decrease in the infant mortality rate, likely because of that. Now, normally, how would the CDC publicize these results because they, they did the work, right? They would embargo the study. Um, they would send it out to um, all the different media outlets, along with talking points and further details. That would allow then these media outlets to interview the authors or interview uh, people, press people at the CDC so that they can then get ahead of that publication in, in this case, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, which is a publication by the CDC. None of that happened. And the reason it didn't happen was that the Department of Health and Human Services, specifically the Secretary of Health and Human Services, said that we are not going to promote this. We are not going to promote this strategy to prevent hospitalization and arguably death in babies. So the, the Secretary of HHS has that kind of power over CDC? Yes, over CDC, over NIH, and over FDA. Yes, he has that kind of power. Why did he decide not to uh, publicize this? It's an important result, right? Because Rob, because Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is an anti-vaccine activist and science denialist. This is the last thing he wants to do is to promote vaccines. I mean, he has managed to ignore the outbreaks of pertussis, influenza, and measles that have gone on in the past year, all of which have caused deaths in children. You don't hear a word from him about any of that. And in fact, the uh, director of CDC's Office of Communication has also resigned, right? Why was that? For that reason. I mean, he felt, Griffiths felt that he, um, he wasn't able to communicate 
the information about health to the public that he needed to communicate. He felt that he was being stifled by the current administration, which basically is ignoring infectious diseases and ignoring the things that can prevent infectious diseases. It's gotten that bad. So why why would you want this information publicized? What would be the, the benefits to the general population knowing this? That's a great question. The reason that it gets publicized is just so people can know about it. So, for example, only about a third of uh, people who are pregnant get an RSV vaccine. Uh, uh, only about a little less than half of babies who are recommended, all babies are recommended less than seven months of age to receive this long-acting monoclonal antibody, a little less than half get it. So by promoting that, by saying, look, this is working, it's having an effect, you can decrease your baby's chance of coming to the hospital by either vaccinating yourself or giving this passive uh, monoclonal antibody to your baby so that we can increase rates. That's the purpose of that. So the, suppressing this information or muzzling the CDC, as you call it, is really malicious because babies will die, right? That's right. That's, that's exactly right. That's for the same reason that RFK Jr. has specifically gone out and, and misrepresented uh, the measles vaccine at a time during a measles outbreak. I mean, RSV is an important disease in children. I mean, we our, our, every winter, our hospital, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, is flooded with influenza and respiratory syncytial virus. Flooded. Our intensive care unit is flooded with this virus. And here's a way to prevent it. Finally, I mean, we've been working on an RSV vaccine where the scientists have been working working on an RSV vaccine since the 1960s. It has not been an easy vaccine to make, and I think we finally figured it out. So we, we have mentioned this multiple times before, but you know, RFK Jr. has said he wants to give infectious diseases a break for eight years. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> They're certainly not going to be giving us a break. What he means by that is he wants to ignore them. He wants to focus on other things. He wants to focus on chronic diseases and their, quote, unquote, root causes. First of all, you can do both. I mean, I think it's important to look at, at disease in general, but you can't ignore infectious diseases. I, I mean, how many pandemics do we have to have over the last 20 years to tell us that pandemics can be enormously destructive? So it's uh, it's um, this goes along with something we've talked about in the past, which he actually doesn't embrace the germ theory of infectious diseases. He doesn't believe that specific germs cause specific diseases. He believes that if you're well nourished, you're never going to suffer these diseases. So that's always been what he talks about: just better diets, better nutrition. And so during a measles outbreak, he talks endlessly about the miracle cure of vitamin A without talking about the miracle prevention of measles vaccine. RFK Jr. has also said he wants to have radical transparency in uh, HHS. What does that mean? Well, it means being open with the American public. Uh, we're all for that. But if you if you believe in radical transparency or transparency at all, then you should be transparent about the fact that the CDC just did a study showing that the two modalities that we have to prevent RSV in children <laughs> work. And that you should you should use them so that your baby doesn't have to suffer this horrible disease. But no, he keeps that from the American public. He does what he can to keep that from the American public by not allowing the CDC uh, to promote this important finding. Yeah, so muzzling the CDC is not radical transparency. But I guess inconsistency is the uh, the means of the day with this administration. It's not... The only time he has muzzled health information, we've talked about it before here, right? Yes, that's right. I mean, it, it, there, there are promotional campaigns for influenza, for measles, et cetera, that he has done everything he can to just stop. Yeah, I remember the flu campaign. It was uh, from wild to mild. I thought that was actually pretty good. Perfect, you know, and, right? We're just and it's to gone. It. He's right. cut that out. It doesn't mention pertussis at all. doesn't really mention measles anymore. So it's still, still ongoing. All right, so Paul, what can we do about this problem? I mean, to him not doing something, it's hard it's hard to litigate that, right? If you don't do something, you know, if you do something and it causes harm, that's something else. So what else can be done? 
we can do what you're doing, which is to try and get that information out there into as many outlets as possible so that people know about it. I mean, Daniel Griffin has talked about this. You've talked about this. I think it's it's an important finding, and we have to do everything we can to get it out there, despite being sort of muzzled or, or silenced uh, by people like RFK Jr. when the CDC press office isn't allowed to promote something so important. And you, you often go on major news outlets and talk about this. That's important too, right? Right now, actually, I'm supposed to be on CNN tomorrow um, to talk about this RSV study. So um, at least uh, it's some attempt to get it out there, but we need to get it out there far more broadly. You need to be on Fox News, Paul. Happy to. Yeah, I'm sure you would, but they won't ask you. <laughs> well, I've asked them uh, and have generally not been accepted. So Yeah, because so. you talk the truth. That's not what they do, at least in terms of science and public health, unfortunately. All right, we will put a link to this column in the show notes so you can read the details. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent.